Hey everyone, Andy Raphael from eTechnics.com and the Zen 3 processors are kind of here. 5000 series is upon us, so let's talk about it. Let's do this. Never worry about Wi-Fi again. With the fastest Wi-Fi ever and four times the connection capacity so you can connect more, do more, and stream more simultaneously. Orbi Wi-Fi 6 from Netgear. So before we actually start talking about Zen 3 and the 5000 series processors, let's have a little bit of a history lesson. So when Zen launched, well, it was pretty damn huge. I mean, it couldn't have been any worse than Pile Driver and even before that Bulldozer, especially when you saw the claims that were coming from AMD in terms of the IPC uplift. So they were talking about a 52% IPC uplift over the predecessor, which I guess isn't exactly hard when Bulldozer and Pile Driver weren't exactly the greatest processors out there. They ran hot. They weren't really comparative to Intel. It was a pretty tricky situation for AMD in general. So Ryzen initially launched in early 2017. And while it was good to see competition, Intel still kind of had that upper hand, especially when it came to gaming. When second gen Ryzen came along, we saw huge jumps, mainly with a massive IPC uplift again, better memory compatibility at faster speeds, which is definitely needed, especially when you look at gaming, and also more cores and faster cores at that. And then third gen Ryzen came along and it just kind of, again, matured and it just got so much better. So what did third gen Ryzen processors give us above and beyond that? Well, they actually took things even further once again. We had, again, a huge IPC uplift, and we also saw the fabrication process shrink down from 12 nanometer all the way down to 7 nanometer, basically giving us the first consumer desktop processors on that fabrication process. There were other things that came along with the third gen Ryzen processors as well. Again, we saw a huge IPC uplift of around 15%, but on top of that, it did pave the way for new chipsets. So we had X570 and now B550, giving us extra functionality that hasn't been seen from either AMD or Intel. And of course, I'm talking about PCI Express Gen 4. So this basically gave us blistering fast speeds on the storage side of things, and also gave us, I guess, future compatibility and future proofing when it came to graphics cards. What I'm basically trying to say is now it's actually even cheaper to get faster speeds than what we've ever been able to get in the past. And again, going from second gen to third gen Ryzen, we did see the memory compatibility getting even better. So we now have support of speeds of up to 3200 megahertz natively, but we were able to see even memory speeds surpassing that. So while this was all well and good, Yes, AMD were making huge strides and really sort of, you know, actually taking up quite a lot of market share from Intel, but still Intel managed to keep hold of that gaming crown. When it came to gaming, Intel just, I don't know, seemed to be that little bit better than AMD. And for the average consumer out there, that's what matters. I mean, when we look at our own testing, we can see that the flagship Intel counterpart still outperforming AMD by sometimes over 15 frames per second, which is pretty damn huge. Well, AMD had to do something. Luckily, the seven nanometer process gave AMD engineers something to work on as time went on. They were able to look at it and give instructions to TSMC to increase the speeds of the cores on certain chips. And this is where the 3600 XT, 3800 XT and the 3900 XT were born. So the 3600 XT and 3900 XT both gave a 100 megahertz extra boost speed over their non-T parts while the 3800 XT gave an extra 200 megahertz boost speed over the 3800X. Sadly, this still wasn't enough and Intel, even with their flagship of the last gen, 9900K, still outperformed AMD where it mattered to the majority of consumers. Gaming. I mean, in our own testing, we still actually saw it slip behind by some margin, even in some cases behind the Core i5-10600K, which does actually come in dramatically cheaper. The good news is that AMD were able to hold their own in other tasks, such as workload, rendering, calculation, and all the other stuff that gamers would consider, well, boring. Heck, they even brought out the 16-core 32-thread monster Ryzen 9 3950X. Even with that many cores and that many threads of boost speeds up to 4.7 GHz, they were still, thanks to the 7 nanometer process, able to keep the TDP down to 105 watts. For comparison, the 10900K actually comes in at, well, 125 watts. So up until this point, it's kind of been a bit of a weird success story for AMD. I guess in a roundabout way, they've been able to hold Intel accountable and make sure that they're not, I don't know, just sailing on by, getting away with not giving the consumers everything they want. And that's where this all comes down to. It's all to do with the consumers because, and I say this quite a lot actually, there's only going to be one winner throughout this whole thing. And it's going to be you guys, the consumer, having choice from AMD, having choice from Intel, having a bit of a price war go on, performance war go on, 
it's just brilliant. It's, it really is an exciting time to be alive. So where do AMD kind of go from here? Well, a lot of it comes down to what is the missing link in the puzzle for AMD. And really, as I mentioned, that comes down to gaming. So they had to do something and suddenly, Zen 3 was born. So you may remember that AMD were quizzed on Zen 3 and its release date, and I'm not surprised by some of the releases this year from a variety of different brands, it's not exactly gone the way that consumers hoped. Although saying that, it does actually seem to me that AMD have made huge strides within the community. It seems like they're actually listening to, well, their users, the people who are actually buying their products. They kind of have this weird cult following. I know we've all heard of AMD fanboys, Intel fanboys. AMD just seem to have done something within the community that's really sort of, you know, making strides. So what did AMD actually say when the community reached out to them about Zen 3? Well, they said, don't worry, it will be launching this year. And now after viewing the event and seeing the release date of November the 5th, yeah, they were actually sticking to their promises. Hopefully they don't go and do an Nvidia and have stock issues, but I don't know, maybe that could happen. Maybe it couldn't, who knows in the current pandemic and what's going on in the world. So what does Zen 3 actually offer? Well, according to AMD, it gives us a whole host of goodies. We get higher frequencies, higher IPC, design improvements, lower latency, the works. I mean, for instance, the new core design allows for lower latency between each core, meaning that each core can access the huge 32 megabyte L3 cache. I mean, for instance, imagine that a CPU is only as fast as the slowest core. Well, not anymore, because now that it can access that L3 cache in a completely different way, it's all going to kind of, you know, have that improvement collectively, and that's going to end up in course reducing latency, which then is consequently going to give us better frame rates. Also, AMD were not really content with the 15% uplift that we saw before. So now Zen 3 gives a whopping 19% IPC uplift. I really do have to say this again and again, but I really consider AMD kind of like a fine red wine or a cheese. They're just maturing with time. It also shows that the more AMD have been able to learn about the seven nanometer process, it's allowed them to push things further than they've ever really anticipated themselves. Also with AMD knowing how Microsoft works in terms of pushing processors to the dominant core, it now allows for each core accessing the 32 meg of L3 cache instead of two times 16 meg stores. In layman's terms, it basically means that the cores can access that cache so much quicker independently, talk to each other a lot, lot quicker, again, reducing latency, and again, giving you better frame rates, which is pretty much what we saw from the live stream. So another thing AMD are doing, they're always looking at performance per watt. And this is why so many people were shouting about the 10th gen Intel CPUs and how they were gonna be portable furnaces. Obviously they weren't that bad and AMD did have the upper hand in the fact that they were using seven nanometer process compared to Intel's 14 nanometer plus, 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 plus. Is it plus, plus, plus or plus, plus? Who knows anymore? AMD also claimed that Zen 4 with its five nanometer process is on track in terms of their roadmap. So what did AMD actually launch? Well, firstly, it was all about the 5900X. So this is a 12 core, 24 thread processor boosting up to 4.8 gigahertz. Compared to the 3900X, that's an extra 200 megahertz on the boost clock while keeping the same core and thread count and the same amount of combined L2 and L3 cache. It also keeps the same 105 watt TDP to keep it ahead of the competition. So you may actually be wondering, well, what else does it offer? I mean, 200 megahertz is nice and all, but I could get that through just, you know, purely manual overclocking. Well, it's all about that 19% uplift on the IPC. When comparing the newly released 3900 XT and comparing it to the 5900 X in Shadow of the Tomb Raider on high settings at 1080p, AMD's own results saw a huge 40 FPS increase. That's a whopping 28%. Based on our own testing, this would mean the 5900 X, based on these figures and comparing, would sit comfortably ahead of the 10900K by around 25 FPS. AMD also showed the performance increase in a variety of titles using DX11, DX12 and Vulkan. Though we did see in more intensive games like Battlefield 5, the increase was a lot smaller at around 5%. While games that can run on a potato like League of Legends and CSGO saw the biggest increase, which I guess kind of inflates the figures just a little bit. Obviously, I would urge anyone to see independent reviews from the likes of ourselves and others at a variety of resolutions to see if taking the plunge and upgrading it is really gonna be worth it for you. So AMD also spoke about Cinebench and pure single core performance. Something that I guess, you know, when you're on the top of a leaderboard, looks very, very good, especially to, uh, you know, shareholders. So from our own testing, the best CPU we've had for single core performance was the 3800 XT, giving us a score of 538, beating the Intel 10900K by a whopping one. 
yeah, w one point. That's that's what it beat it by. I mean, technically, if we were to run them tests on both processors over and over and over, you'd probably see the results kind of go like this by one or two points. It's just, I don't know, let's call it margin of error. On AMD's testing, they scored a 544 on the 10900K, while the 5900X comes in with a staggering 631 points. So that uplift has definitely had an impact there. While this isn't going to do much on the gaming side of things, as I mentioned, it certainly looks great on leaderboards, being at the very top for a consumer desktop CPU. This was also something that consumers wanted, and I, I absolutely love it when a brand, especially one as corporate as AMD, actually listen to their fans and the people who are, well, you know, keeping them in business. They were also keen to show the 5900X at 1080p compared to the 10900K using the same games that they showed before. I mean, I'm a little bit dubious about this, and for one very good reason. Take out the archaic games that they kind of had in there, and the ones that run on pretty much a potato, CSGO, League of Legends, and you're only really left with, on the intense side of things, Battlefield 5, Shadow of the Tomb Raider, Far Cry New Dawn, even though it's a little bit old now. So does that really paint us a full picture? Probably not. So this actually showed worse performance in Battlefield 5 by 3%, better by up to 2% in Far Cry New Dawn and 6% in Shadow of the Tomb Raider and then 5% in Ashes of the Singularity. Again, I would urge you to actually wait for benchmarks from ourselves and others where you kind of get a general idea as to how things run, especially even at a multitude of resolutions as well. So while the 5900X is, I guess, the flagship of gaming, I'm actually a little bit more excited about its little brother, the 5800X. So this comes in spec-wise with 8 cores, 16 threads, and boost to 4.7 GHz. Again, on paper, compared to the 3800X, it's the same combined cache, the same TDP, and just a 200 MHz boost clock in the clock speed. Then as we move down the stack again, we have the 5600X, which is 6 cores and 12 threads, boosting to 4.6 GHz, and you guessed it, the same combined cache, the same core and thread counts as its predecessor, the 3600X. This time, however, while it's 200 MHz faster on the boost clock, it's actually dramatically managed to reduce the TDP down from 95 watts to 65 watts. Now, while the boost clock speed is very, very nice to have, it's actually worth noting, and I don't know if anyone else noticed this, all of the base clock speeds have actually dropped by 100 MHz. Why is that? So what about pricing? Obviously, they'd have to come in under Intel to still be AMD, the underdog, the one who's always been cheaper for the enthusiasts and gamers ever since... I can even remember. So with that in mind, pricing comes in with the 5600X at $299, 5800X at $449, and the 5900X at $549. So these are actually coming out at $50 more expensive MSRP than what the predecessors did when they launched, including the XT models when they launched as well. They're all also going to be available on November the 5th, and hopefully stock isn't going to be an issue. So they also actually mentioned, obviously, one more thing. It seems like whenever you have a live stream or a press event like this, it's always like, thank you very much. But before we go, one more thing. So yeah, 5950X. I mean, it was kind of inevitable after the 3950X launched. So what's that all about? Well, it's a 16 core 32 thread monster, as you'd expect, with boost speeds up to 4.9 gigahertz. I'm a little bit sad that they didn't get to that magical 5 gigahertz number, but again, it's not just about speed, it's a multitude of things that combine together. Lisa Su also mentioned the performance increase over the 3950X, and we saw some pretty impressive numbers for those doing kind of workload related tasks. For me personally, I'd like to see how it actually performs in DaVinci Resolve with Blackmagic 6K raw footage, which is exactly what we use to record. It's something that you really do need the best of the best to run it. And I don't know, is it actually going to do the job? Is it going to be better than Intel, especially with their HEDT based processors? Only time will tell. AMD also showed us the 5950X in games. Now, they wouldn't be the ones I'd personally choose. So again, I'd wait to see our results before making your decision. But compared to the 10900K, again, the 5950X showed some great strides being made in rendering and workload tests. In gaming, they show improvements over the 10900K, though by a small margin in a certain amount of games. I mean, show me something a little bit more intensive. Battlefield 5, Call of Duty, Control. That's what I'd personally like to see. So pricing-wise, it's going to come in at $799. US Again, you guessed it, $50 more expensive than its predecessor, the 3950X. But it didn't stop there. Lisa showed off a small glimpse of the new RDNA 2 based graphics card dubbed Big Navi. Or as she called it, Big Navi. But, you know, who am I to judge? Now, I do love the fact that they named it after the community feedback again. It's refreshing to see a corporate brand like AMD really listening to their consumers and fans. And, I don't know, just kind of being in touch with them. It's just something nice to see. 
Now, while we weren't told what model it was, it's safe to say it's likely going to be their flagship, which should likely be called the 6900 XT. They also showed us the 5950X and Big Navi together in Borderlands 3. While they showed the typical Borderlands 3 benchmark at 4K, Lisa Sue asked us to look at that performance on a live stream that was being shown at 30 FPS. No. She did claim that it was performing at over 60 FPS at 4K, but didn't tell us what quality setting and we didn't get to see any exact numbers. So over 60 FPS could be 60.1 as far as I'm concerned. While I don't want to be critical, vital information was left out to be able to judge this fairly in my opinion. Still, it is nice to see something, anything. So yeah, it was a nice little treat. We did, however, see a chart which, if it relates to my previous point, answers kind of everything that I've just said. If not though, yeah, we still have to go on, well, basically nothing. So essentially we saw Borderlands 3 on badass quality at 4K getting 61 FPS, Call of Duty Modern Warfare on Ultra at 88, and Gears 5 on Ultra again at 4K at 73 FPS. So things are looking hopeful. How much of this is the GPU and how much of this is the CPU though is hard to judge at the moment. Again, this is why I would urge you to wait. I'm, I'm not a fan of pre-ordering stuff and things like that, even if they're not gonna be available on that date and you're gonna be able to order them without seeing benchmarks and stuff. In my opinion, wait, see the benchmarks and see if it's gonna be right for you. So based on what you know now, what are you actually gonna do? Are you gonna go out and buy one of these processors? Are you gonna stick with what you've already got? Are you on AMD? Are you on Intel? Are you gonna be waiting for sort of Intel and what they come out with with Rocket Lake? Like I said, that's gonna be 2021. Can you really hold out for that long? Now, the weird thing for me is everyone's sort of taken to social media and they're going, AMD have done it, they're, they're killing Intel. Well, of course they are. Their newer product is beating Intel's older product. So what's going to happen next when Rocket Lake's going to come out is it's probably going to beat AMD's old product. Then AMD are going to beat that and that. and It's called leapfrogging. It's really simple. Newer product is better than older product. So yeah, but let me know what one you are, you're actually going to go for. For me, it's probably going to be the 5800X. It seems to be that sweet spot of really giving you the features, the clock speed, the uplift for a reasonable price point. Yes, it's $50 more than what the predecessor was, but it's still, I don't know, better than the competition, I guess. And that's the main thing. Although it is hard to ignore that $299 5600X. I mean, I'm probably going to hazard some guesses here that they're gonna be coming out with a 5600 non-X part. And that's probably gonna be the best value for money part that's ever existed because that's what we saw with third gen with the 3600. And before that, it was the 2600. And before that, you guessed it, the 1600. So yeah, it's gonna be interesting to see what follows, I guess, beyond these chips that they've actually announced. I don't know, either way, it's an exciting time for us consumers, especially those who are really into gaming because maybe, just maybe, AMD have actually finally done it when it comes to gaming performance. But time will tell, we will see. Don't go out and buy it straight away. Check out the results from independent reviewers like myself and make your decisions from there. Hopefully you enjoyed this video. If you did, you know exactly what to do and I will see you in the next one. See you later guys, bye bye.